emails which were going around for the last few weeks. It's a, so, it's a, it's a story, and the name of the based the story is obviously eventually recorded in the book, the book which describes the road. My soul is filled with joy, which are part of this presentation tonight is going to give you insight into the name of the book. This is what I learned when I listened to the lecture last time. It's a story of survival, a story of tikkun olam, in unity, Jews are being miraculously saved, non-Jews are being inspired to help and to bring them to to survive. A lot, a lot of interesting pieces to the story. I am personally also a grandson of Holocaust survivors. My grandmother, who passed away two years ago, last week, Mrs. Farkas, Rokhulea Farkas, was a Holocaust survivor with a number on his arm, an Auschwitz survivor, and some of you already heard from me the stories. Uh, this was one of our activities every summer. We used to come visit our grandmother for a longer extended time. So every year, the plan was that this summer we are removing the number from Bobby. And she used to join with us, buy seats in soaps, and, <laughs> and, and put out an arm in this sink, maybe warm water, cold water. But in this year, we are taking the number off. Obviously, she lived all her life with that number till two years ago, just on Purim in Yerushalayim. This year, the Talif year is when she passed away at my uh, living a very wonderful life. She got married to my grandfather. We lost his wife and two kids in Auschwitz. They were second cousins, so they got married right after the war. My father was one of the first babies in a DP camp called Poking in Germany. He's still on his passport still today. And Baruch Hashem, my mother and my father, just one of her children, which by this year marked the, the number 100, but grandchildren and the grandchildren. So this is just little surviving stories of one person. <laughs> A person that we grew up with all our life. My wife, Lachi, is going to be here soon, so we all know her stories. Mrs. Weiss and Mr. Weiss, the Rosse in Auschwitz, came to visit our community a number of times, especially on Simchas, at Risen. We all know what survival brought to them, as far as family, community support, and the many great activities which they had accomplished. But every story of survival is a story. I think tonight you're going to hear a whole unique story. And I'm very happy that um, you came out to hear, that you're going to truly enjoy it. Without any further ado, please let me welcome Ms. Karen Trager, who is going to share with us tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It, um, you know, hearing the story of your grandparents and, and, and your wife's grandparents does remind us yet again that everyone who everyone who survived the Shoah, the Holocaust, has a very intense and miraculous story. And I think sometimes it's important to realize that the stories of survival that we all are privileged and honored to hear and to be part of, Hanayna Hora, a hundred grandchildren, that's amazing. And um, this is from the one shot. Mama, you can pick up another shot. Poo, poo, poo. Uh, but I think it's also just important to remind ourselves yet again that the, that the ones who survived are the unusual ones. That most of the Jews of Europe, and especially certainly of Poland, which is, the, I'm telling a story of two Polish Jews, that they, they perished in the war, they were murdered. And that's an important thing to remember. We don't, we don't hear their stories. Very, very rarely do we get to hear the stories of those, of those kadoshim, of those holy people. So tonight, I'm actually honored to tell the story of my in-laws, 
Sam and Esther Goldberg, and um, Shlomo came with me tonight. Thank you, Shlomo, my husband. This is their son. And um, they are also Kedoshim, and they, but then they were miraculously lucky, and with the help of Hashem, were able to, to survive. So I apologize to all of you, and I apologize to Sam and Esther, who are no longer with us in the world of the living, that I have to tell their story tonight in an abbreviated fashion in order to bring you in and give you a taste of what happened to them. And I'll, I'll just encourage you to read the book because the book has much more detail and many more um, of the miraculous stories that happened to them than I can possibly share with you this evening in a, in a short presentation. So um, I hope that at the end of the presentation, I'll be welcoming questions and discussion, whatever, whatever we want to talk about, there'll be time for, for some of that. So, so hold on to your questions and your thoughts because you, I'm sure you will have them. Do you need me to stand in one place? Because I kind of usually walk around. Okay, cool. Because I'm not a stander. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for coming. And I married into this family, the Goldberg family, in 1984. And this is a picture of Shlomo and myself at our wedding, and um, which we remember fondly and well. It was here in Seattle. I'm a Seattleite by birth and grew up here. I'm a fifth generation Seattleite on my mom's side. Uh, my father's side is um, a little more typical. The Jewish community, they came um, turn of the century from Belarus. And, and Poland. Um, but Shlomo's parents came, of course, after the war. And when we get married, I, I venture to say that we, we don't always know what we're getting ourselves into. We, we marry someone, we're very excited about it, but we really don't know what we're jumping into, right? Well, I really didn't know what I was jumping into because I married into a Holocaust family. This is Sam and Esther Goldberg, my in-laws. This is how I knew them. They, when I got married, when I married into the family, they were already retired, living in Florida. And um, they're both sole survivors of their large families from Poland. And as I got to know them, and I got to learn their stories, I grew to love them, and I was in, I was in awe of, of what they lived through. And then they both died. My mother-in-law, Esther, died some 21 years ago, and Sam died about 16, 17 years ago. And um, their stories, the only way I tried to describe and think to myself, what, like, what happened? What happened to me when, when they died? Like, I'm not their child. I mourned their death, but not in the same way, of course, as a, as a child. But I feel like their stories sort of settled on my heart. They just sort of went right there. And I was worried, I was very worried that their stories would die with them. And I wanted to write this, their stories as a book. I wanted to do it for 25 years, but it wasn't, it wasn't a time. We were raising four children. We lived here in Seattle. I was practicing law. I'm, I'm a lawyer by profession. And uh, it just, it wasn't the right time. But you know what? Three and a half years ago, I decided it was the right time. My children were grown up. Three of them already <laughs> gone out of the house. Our last one was still home at, in high school. And so I left my law practice and I decided to write the story. The book that I ended up actually writing is not the book that I ever dreamed would emerge from my computer. And I, I will share with you what, what I mean by that. You will see what I mean. I thought I'd write their story. It would be a great, a great thing for our family, great thing for the Jewish people, great thing for the world to hear the story of these, of these amazing human beings. But it became much more. Their story became my story. And it was, I, I changed dramatically over the course of the last three years in ways that I am very grateful for and very happy about. So I knew though that if I was going to tell their story, that I couldn't tell their story how I knew them, you know, in their 70s and in their 80s. No, no. I had to go back and meet them when they were in their 20s during the time of the war. This is Sam and Esther when they were in their 20s. These are pictures after the war, but yet yeah, they were in their 20s. I'm going to share the, the brief versions of their story, and again, with apologies to my in-laws for, for making it brief. I'm going to tell you Esther's story, and then I'm going to switch to Sam's story, and then they will merge. 
So Esther was born in a small town called Suchik. Let's see, I think this should work on this one. Yeah, look at that. My screen looks good. Suchik, Poland. This is Badakpela over here. That's where Sam was born. You can see how close these towns are. They're maybe, you know, 30 miles apart. Uh, but of course, they were small towns. Esther's town, Stuchet, was a shtetl. Very, very typical Jewish shtetl in Poland. About 90% Jews, about 10% non-Jews. Her father and her father, here's a picture of her father and mother. If you know people who survived the war, or you know stories about people who survived the war, you know that many, many pictures, most people did not survive their pictures. Pictures are a rarity. In these, in these cases. And Esther's, this one picture of Esther's parents somehow survived the war. And, whoa, sorry. This is her father, Shlema, Shlema Zalman, Vishnu. Their last name was Vishnu. And Rafa, these are her parents. This is Esther in her 20s. Shlema Zalman was a Malamid. He was a teacher of elementary school children. And they came every day to his home where he caught the children Alphes, he taught them Chomesh, he taught them how to daven. He was a, a shtetl, old, old, old school Malamid. And this picture of this house here is a typical home in the shtetl of Stuchin. It's a picture that I took in 2016 when I, when I went back with my family to visit. So it looks really, I know it looks really terrible, and I promise it looks way worse in person. It's really <laughs> falling apart house. But uh, I, through my research and through interviewing people, I understand that this is the house, this was a very typical house in Stuchik. So I imagine this was the type of house that Esther's family lived in. And um, imagine, so you have to like imagine 75 years ago, maybe it looked a little better. But let's just hope, right? I'm sure it did, I'm sure it looked better. So this is, it was a one room house with a little, with an alcove. And this is here, this uh, chimney is sticking up at the top here, is the, what we call the Chavichok, right? The song by the Chavichok. This is the Chavichok. This is the Chavichok. And it's the heart that warms the whole home. Here, this area right here, is a triangular area that was an, an attic in, in the homes. And that's, that attic in these types of homes becomes one of the places that um, Esther survives in hiding to evade the, the Nazi roundup of her town. So the Nazis invade Poland. The war begins September 1, 1939. Very ominous day in, 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 the, in, in the history of the world. And um, there were 3.3 3 .3 million Polish Jews, the largest Jewish community in the world at the time. It had been in existence for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the um, Polish army was defeated within weeks. They were imagined, the, the German army is coming in with airplanes, with bombs, dropping bombs everywhere, and with infantry, and machine guns, and shooting people, and burning down houses, and shops, with really terrorizing the local population. That's how they took control so quickly of everywhere they went. They just terrorized the people into submission. That's, that's really what happened. But then, um, I want to just explain, when the Germans attacked, this is the way they attacked. The Germans and the Soviets had made an agreement before the war started to each attack Poland from, e uh, from either side, the west and the east. And so Esther's town is here, Stuchik. The Germans attack from the west, and they come in here, just barreling in with bombs and infantry and guns blazing. The Soviets, two weeks later, come in this way, and they conquer this part of, the, uh, part of Poland, and the Germans conquer this part of Poland. Very quickly, the Germans annex a section of Poland, like right around here. They annex it into Germany. It becomes part of Germany. The middle part here, this like kind of stomach area is how I think about it, becomes German-controlled territory, but not annexed to Germany proper. And the other side becomes Soviet territory and um, is controlled by Stalin and the Soviet Union, the communists. So Esther, her area is here. She, her town is now controlled by the Germans. Her house was one of the homes in the small town of Stuchik that was initially burned to the ground. And now here is her family, her parents, her siblings, and herself. They have no house. And they had to decide what to do. And the Germans were firmly, quickly in control of their town. 
They knew right away that living under German control was not going to be a good idea as a Jew. And so like hundreds and thousands of Jewish people in the German-controlled area of Poland, they went east. And they went to the east side of that line. They traveled from here over to the east side. So here I want to show you where they went. The first place they went was a town called Bialystok. And it's Bialystok, they traveled like this. And you can see how far it was, right? So that's where they lived, and they lived, Esther lived in Bialystok for about a year. So now they're under Soviet control. The Soviets, many people who lived under the Soviet control did end up getting um, packed off, let's just say, transported to Siberia, which was, a, at the time, everyone thought that was just the worst thing that could have happened to you, because it was really terrible living conditions there. It was freezing cold, very harsh. It was a very hard life. But with hindsight, now we know, looking backwards, that ending up in Siberia was a bracha, was a blessing, because those people survived the war, and 90% of the other people did not survive the war. But Esther lived in Bialystok, and there, because it was Soviet, she became a Soviet citizen, and she was able to get a job. And she got a job, first she was knitting hats, making a little bit of money, her brothers got jobs working on the railroads, her parents and her younger siblings didn't have jobs. And so the Soviets, because it was so crowded, Bialystok, before the war, was 100,000 citizens. 50% were Jews, 50% were non-Jews. Within a few months after the war broke out, the Bialystok jumped to 200,000 people. In months, the extra 100,000 were all Jewish refugees from the German side of that line that, that I just showed you. So it was very crowded. So the Soviets came around and just said, oh, you don't have jobs, we're gonna move you out of town, we're gonna move you somewhere else. So they moved Esther's parents and her siblings all the way to Slonim. And again, you can see how far it is. And that's a picture of an old shul in Slonim. Um, Esther and her brothers ultimately decided, we need to be with our family. Whatever's gonna happen in Slonim, we'll get a job there, we'll figure it out. So they all rejoined together in Slonim. And they lived there. And they manage. Again, the Soviets don't want to murder them like, like the Germans might want to. Um, and the Germans really, at that point, just wanted the Jews to leave. There was no grand final solution, as we think of it now, that of, of murdering all the Jews where they lived. Not in 1939. Not even in 1940. It developed over time. So Esther is living with her family in Slonim. And it is in that place and after two years go by, when the Germans decide they are going to rip up their friendship pact with the Soviet Union, because that was what they did, they made a deal. They said, we'll be friends, you attack this way, we'll attack this way, good, everybody's happy. Well, the Germans ripped up their friendship pact and attacked the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941. Again, an ominous day for the world and certainly for the Jewish people because it was at that point that the final solution was coming into much clearer vision. And it was at that point, as the German army began to attack from that yellow line, remember the yellow line, that's where they started, they went east, into the eastern part of Poland, into the Ukraine, to Lithuania, and they, you know, the German army wanted to go all the way to, uh, to Moscow, they wanted to get St. Petersburg. We know, we know what, they, what they were trying to do, they were trying to take over all, of the, whole, all the territory and all the people. But, there was another group of the German army right behind the main army. A much smaller group, but a very terrifying group from our perspective, because that group was called the Einsatzgruppe, and their job was to gather the Jews of the towns, of the cities, of the smallest hamlets, and gather them together and take them out of town and shoot them into pits, one by one, to shoot them. And that, is what happened to Esther's family in Slonim. In August of 1941, the German army arrives in Slonim, and the Einsatzgruppen gather the Jews of the town, there were seven to 10,000 Jews living there at the time, and they take them out of town, and they murder each one of them in pits. And that's how Esther's family was killed in the, in the Shoah. So what happened to Esther? 
she survived. She survived because she was sick. She had typhus. She had a terrible disease. Typhus was a disease. The ghettos, the areas where the Jews lived were very, very crowded. And it's not the cleanest place to live. So typhus was passed easily and quickly. And she got sick. And she got put into the hospital. And that's where she was when her family was taken and all the Jews of Slumen were taken. But in a very twist of fate that I can't fathom, but it's true because I found this in my research. Esther never told us about this. I found it in a research, in research through someone else's story. I found out that two days later, someone, the Nazis come back to town and they go back to that hospital where Esther is a patient and they shoot every single patient in their bed. Now, what happened there? Why didn't she get killed that massacre? So she missed the big massacre because she was in the hospital. And she missed the hospital massacre because she had left. As soon as she found out about what happened to her parents and the, what happened in Slonim, she left the hospital. She said, I'm done here. I'm well enough. Thank God I'm well. I'm getting out. And she left. And she decided she was going back home. Back home meaning to Stuchik. And it took her a few months to get back home, but that's what she did. And that's how she survived these twin horrific massacres of the Einsatzgruppen in Slunum. The Einsatzgruppen murdered a million people within nine months in this way, one by one, going town to town. That was the first stage of the final solution. We are going to leave Esther in Stuchik. She now went back home to Stuchik. And we're going to leave her there for a moment and just tell a little bit of Sam's story. Sam was born in a town called Bagatella. This is a map. I'll have to explain the map. I'm sorry, it went so fast. This town called Bagatella is like right around here. And again, it was on the German side of that yellow line. And so when the Germans attacked, his town was so small. We visited it in 2016, and it's one road that goes like this. It's a dirt road that winds through. There's farms on either side, houses, barns. That's it. That's the whole town. So they weren't the first spot that the Germans came to take control of and to attack. So they kicked it out. By the time they got there, it was already like, let's say, November, a couple months later. The German officer came, knocked on their door, and Sam's father was named, um, was named Zelig, Zelig Goldberg. And he came to the door, and the Nazi officer says, get out. You Jews, you leave. And he said he really didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay as long as he could. And, and he's like, well, I don't want to leave. Why should I leave? And he said, you're a dirty Jew. We don't want you here. Get out. So in the meantime, most of the other children in the family, and a number of them were already married, they left right away because they just said, this isn't good. We're going to the Soviet side. So they all went to the Soviet side, except Sam, Shlomo's dad, who just wanted to stay with his parents. And he did. So Sam and his parents went together across that border to the Soviet side. They didn't go very far. Remember, Esther's family went all the way, that big arrow to, to, to Bialystok, and then all the way to Slonim. They went really, really close by. They went to a place called Kova Lopka, and it was right here. And so they were like right here, and they crossed the border and went here. It wasn't very far. Why did they go there? The typical story, they had relatives there. So they went there, and they settled there, and they got Soviet citizenship, just like, just like Esther did in Bialystok. And at first, that was terrific for, for Sam. He got a job. He got a job delivering the mail. He had a horse, his family had a horse and buggy. He took his horse and buggy and he delivered the mail. You can just imagine, maybe he got a cap. I don't know, but he delivered the mail to the towns and to the people of the towns in the small towns around there. Well, now he's a Soviet citizen and the Soviets came to him and drafted him into the Soviet army. So now here's this Jewish young man, probably about 22 years old, 
from this tiny farming town of Bagatella. He's now a Soviet citizen, and all of a sudden, now he's a Soviet soldier. And he had to go with the Soviet army to this place called Chekhanovic. So you can see he goes from Chokolovka to Chekhanovic. And there, his job with his army unit was to build and repair bridges. He describes this period of his life, and he had a lot of really terrible periods of his life, but he describes this period of his life as terrible. He, he, he did, he said the food was terrible. He said he wouldn't have fed that food to the animals on his farm, it was so bad. And they, they had, the living conditions were terrible. It was, it was really terrible. The, it was horrible, he hated being away from his parents. It was the first time he was away from his family, ever, from his parents. He hated it. But it was there in Chekhanovic, which was really only like maybe <coughs> 10, 20 miles from that yellow border where the Germans were positioned. That's where he was when the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in June of 1941. And now Achimbe, he's a Soviet soldier being attacked by the German army. And the German army came in with Air, we've all seen all the pictures of the German army coming in with their airplanes and the bombs, and they bombed the, the army right there in Chekhanovic where they were where they were working, and they came in with infantry. Remember, it's near the border. They were one of the first areas to try to be captured, and Sam said to himself right away, "Okay, this is bad, and how am I going to survive this?" And he decided he would hide under a bridge. There was like a half-built bridge. Remember, their their job was repairing bridges, so he was working on a bridge. And he said to himself, he had a lot of street smarts, a lot of street smarts. He said, okay, maybe if I hide under that bridge, they won't bomb that bridge because it's not a finished bridge. You know, army strategy, you bomb the bridges so they can't run away, right? But that bridge was not, wasn't a complete bridge. So he hid under that bridge. And he was right. They didn't bomb that bridge. Whether it was by accident or on purpose, I have no idea. He, doesn't need, he didn't either but he survived that initial bombing attack by hiding under that bridge. And when he emerged, he describes what he saw because the bombs had murdered hundreds of Soviet soldiers. And he said there were dead bodies like blanketing the ground everywhere. And, but he was alive, but the German soldiers were right there and they captured any Soviet soldiers that were still alive. Sam was captured right away and he was taken with other Soviet soldiers to a POW camp called in, in the town of Zembro, here. <laughs> so now he's in a German prisoner of war camp as a Jewish Soviet soldier. Okay, in the middle of the night, and this is a story that is, it's much better in the book because it's a really great story. But in the middle of the night, he, and three other men escaped the POW camp and they ran away from there and they ran and ran and they were starving and they ended up in, a, in an orchard and this orchard they started eating the fruit and they met they ended up meeting the the orchard owner and it turns out the orchard owner is a Jewish man who recognized Sam through his face because he looks like he looked like his dad and he knew his dad so I'll just say that through the help of this man and his daughter and a scarecrow, Sam survived that escape because the Germans came after them and the other three people that he was with did not survive. So, details in the book. So here Sam is back. He runs away from Zembro camp. He escapes and he runs home, or home. He runs back to where his parents were. He left his parents in Kovalovka. And he was so happy to see that they were still alive and they were still there. And you can only imagine their joy that he was alive and had come back to them. So, but it wasn't good to live in this area because now the Germans were in control of all of this territory. And it wasn't a good thing. But he had heard from other people, the rumor mill was a fire. Like where to go as a Jew? Where's a safe place to live? What should you do? And he heard that it was an okay place to live in Stuchik. And you're gonna remember that name because I just told you that's where Esther's from. Remember, they don't, they don't know each other. So he goes with a few friends and he goes to Stuchik. So you can see that he travels this way down to Stuchik. And then 
from there, the arrow will take us to Treblinka. Because what happened was, he evaded capture from Nazis when there were various roundups. He evaded it, this one, he evaded that one. But his luck ran out in June of 1942. And he was captured in this town of Stuchik with 135 other men. They were put on a truck. Like we think about people going to the death camps in like trains, which of course, the vast majority of them did, almost all of them. But he was taken by a truck to this place that we know of as this horrible death camp called Treblinka. But when he got there, there was nothing there. It was a big open field with one shack. He describes the shack. He said there was one building there. There was nothing there. He had, they had no idea what they were brought there for. They were brought there to build the death camp. The Jews had to build their own death camp. And that's what he was brought there for. And he lived in Treblinka for 13 months. Imagine living in a place that is hell on earth for 13 months. That's what he did. 870,000 people were murdered in Treblinka's gas chambers. Only about 65 people survived. Sam is one of them. Something that I learned in my research, which is even more shocking than the fact that he's one of 65 that survived the death count, is that he was one of two people who survived coming to build the camp, that initial group that was brought to build the camp, only two people survived the whole time until the end of the war, and he's one of them. So his, his survival is remarkable in many ways, and I want to share with you, because he became, through a series of very, um, he will say miraculous events, uh, he became the supervisor of the laundry at Treblinka. So imagine every single day, train load after train load after train load of people are coming to Treblinka. Within 90 minutes, within 90 minutes, they were dead. They had mountains of clothing that came from these, from the Jews that came off the trains. And not only did he clean the mountains of clothing, he also cleaned the Germans' clothing and the Ukrainians' clothing. Something that I learned in my research that um, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around is that Treblinka, where almost, almost a million people were murdered, there were 25 Soviet, sorry, not, we're not in the Soviet world, 25 Nazi officers ran that camp. 25 and 100 Ukrainian guards. They had 800 Jewish prisoners that were slaves, like Sam, like my father-in-law, they were slaves. And they, um, they, re they really did all the hard work at the camp. They ran all the different pieces, including in my father-in-law's laundry. Now the laundry was for Treblinka, it's a terrible place, but it was a great job. Why? There were one, you were indoors. Think about Poland in the winter. Not, not a good place to be outdoors, but most people's jobs were outdoors. And he was indoors, he had, they cooked the, the laundry in big, big tubs. They had 12 huge tubs. Under each tub was a fire. They had fire and water and a big tub. Okay, what can you do with that? You can cook. So he would steal potatoes or anything from the kitchen and they would cook them and then they would eat. He, he worked at one point, he worked with up to 36 women in the laundry. He was the supervisor of the laundry. And he would eat the food he and his, the women that he worked with would eat, and he would take whatever was left to the hospital. Can you imagine, if you were in the hospital at Treblinka, you must have been very close to death. And he told me many times that he feels that it was in the zechus, in the merit of feeding the people in the hospital, that he survived. That's what he felt. Everybody interprets their own survival in different ways. But I want to share with you a story that he shared with us many times um, about something that happened at Treblinka. Again, this place of, of, of where we can't even imagine how, how terrible it was. But even in this place of horror, there was humanity, there was kindness, and there was, there was evil and horror, the same exact moment as kindness and beauty. 
and I'll share with you the way that I portrayed this story that Sam told us about something that happened to him at Treblinka. Let's see if I can read this. Let's stand over here for the light. Sam, can everybody hear me okay? Sam ran the laundry as a business. He didn't know what went on in the, in the, in the other shops, the shoe shop or other Treblinka businesses. I had to make sure that my business was in order, Sam later said, and if I did things in order, I would have success. One day, a Kapo saw some of his relatives get off the train from Warsaw. To save them from the gas chamber, he ordered Sam out of the laundry. The Kapo intended to replace Sam with four of his Warsaw relatives. I've been working here for a year already, Sam said. You're gonna take me out of here and put me in hell? The Kapo started to hit Sam with a bite and a conch. These are whips made of wire and leather. Grabbing a wooden board, Sam hit the capo over the head. Falling to the ground, blood ran from his head. At Treblinka, to hit a capo was a capital offense. The capo called the Nazi Obermuskur, who the prisoners nicknamed Stinker, but Sam called a bastard, a terrible bastard. The stinker ordered the carpenters to build gallows to hang Sam. Don't hang him. Hang the capo, the women of the laundry said to the Obermistrier. If you hang him, hang us all. Why, the stinker asked. Because the Jews are coming now from Warsaw, and the capo was going to take Schmullet out of the laundry and put in four of his relatives, one woman responded. The German asked the capo, what was Sam's crime? He stole money and gave it to the Ukrainians, the capo said. This is not true. He didn't steal any money. He works very hard. But the capo wants to take him out. The woman responded. The old mistreer saw what was going on and gave Sam his gun and gestured that he should shoot the capo. No, I won't do that. I won't shoot anybody. No, sir. I don't want to, said Sam. So the stinker shot the capo in the head, and Sam returned to laundry with his female saviors. As time went by, the year turned to 1943. It became summer, and the transport, which had been coming day in and day out, nonstop, started to slow down. And the people, the workers, those 800 slave laborers, workers that they had there, including Sam, realized that their turn was next in the gas chambers. So about 50 of them, about 50 men, got together and planned an uprising. They said, we are going to fight back, and we are going to try to escape. And their escape, their escape, which did not go exactly as it was planned, but it happened on August 2nd, 1943. And when it happened, the first thing that happened was they blew up the gas, there was a little gas station there where they used to fill up their, their trucks and their, their, you know, their cars. And they blew it up and it turned the whole camp on fire because almost everything was made of wood. And the place was burning on fire and they started shooting and Sam describes how he was part of the uprising. He had a couple grenades and a pistol. And he said he started throwing his his grenades at the at the at the Ukrainian guards and shooting the trying to shoot the Nazi soldiers and but mostly everyone just started running and because they, they they blew up a, they blew a big hole or big whatever side of the hole they blew in the barbed wire fence and so everyone was running through that barbed wire fence hole to get out and the, what you wanted to do was run and run and run until you could get to the forest and it was a you can just imagine that it, it must have been like chaos happening because it was at that point every person for themselves but i read a lot of memoirs about the about treblinka and about treblinka uprising and samuel willenberg who was one of the survivors wrote a beautiful memoir and he in his memoir describes this moment of chaos everybody running and running and running for their lives to get out of that camp because the ukrainian guards in the watchtowers above are still shooting they're still up there shooting as people are, are trying to run out. 
I mean, what, what he describes is that what he remembers most, ringing in his ears, was that all the Jews running out were screaming, hurrah, 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 because they were going out, they were going to freedom. And that's what he remembers most sweetly at that moment of chaos. Well, Sam ran, and he ran out that hole in the fence. And he kept running, and he ran about 10 miles until he reached this patch of Polish forest. And it was in this patch of Polish forest, in this area, that Esther Vishnu had been living already for a year. Esther had been living there with the help of two Christian families named Stish. And she hid sometimes in this barn, sometimes in that barn, sometimes in the forest, different places. Four days, well, let's take it back this way. Three days before the Treblinka uprising, Esther had a dream. If you don't, if you, if you don't yet believe in the power of dreams, now you're going to. Esther had a dream, and in her dream, she saw the, her, the wooden door of her home in Stuching. Remember that house we saw, the wooden door? That's what she saw. On the door was a four. And you know how in a dream, like sometimes you see yourself doing something? So she describes it as she saw herself get up and walk towards the door. And on the door was written a four. And she took a crayon, a red crayon, and wrote on top of it. And now the four was bright and red and really easy to see. And then she woke up. And she was hiding with a teenage boy named Chaim. And she told him, hi, and she told him this dream. I had a dream. This is my dream. I think it means something's going to happen in four days. And he said, if something's going to happen to us in four days, it is not going to be good. I mean, they're Jews hiding in the Polish forest. What, could, what good is going to happen? Well, it was exactly four days after her dream that Sam ended up in this piece of Polish forest where she was hiding. And that's where they met. And he said, I just escaped Treblinka. I mean, they could tell they were Jewish right away. They started speaking Yiddish. It was obvious. And um, Esther was lice covered. Her clothes were rags. And, but she, she met Sam. And she said, come with me. I'll take you to my angels. And she took Sam to her, her angel, Elena Stish. And she said, this man just escaped Treblinka. You have, they, all, they all knew about Treblinka. Everybody in the area knew what was going on in Treblinka, that the Jews were being murdered, gassed, and burned every day. So she did. Terrified. Helena was terrified. Because if they had been found helping a Jew, hiding a Jew, their whole family would be killed. Whole family. She had children. And her, 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 her sister-in-law and brother-in-law who lived next door, they also had children. And they were also helping. But she did. She did it anyway. She was a righteous, righteous woman. These people were beautiful human beings. So Esther, Hi, and Sam hide together. This is, the, this is a picture of the Treblinka uprising, and I found this picture. Um, this is the day of the uprising. It shows the big, remember I described the big explosion? This is a picture of the explosion, and it's taken from about 10 miles away. This picture is described as being about 10 miles away from Treblinka, and I thought to myself, wow, Esther was about 10 miles away from Treblinka in that part of the forest there. That could very well have been her view that day, August 3rd, 1940, August 2nd, 1943. And I think that picture is amazing. So um, they hid together for another year. Sam decided to stay and hide with Chaim and Esther. And together, they went out into the forest, that part that I showed you before, Go a little bit farther and they dug a pit. They dug a pit in the forest and they camouflaged the top and they lived in that pit most of the year. In the cold, in the very cold, they lived in the barns of the Stish family. One of the dads built a fake haystack, like it was a, it was described to us as a wooden box, like a frame of a wooden box with hay, like in the shape, imagine, you know, on a farm, a haystack. So if someone were to enter the barn, they would just see a haystack. They wouldn't see hidden Jews. But that's where they lived, either in the barn in the haystack, maybe another barn here or there, that barn, or mostly in the, in the pit in the forest. 
In July 1944, they were liberated by the Soviet army as it moved through Poland, conquering piece by piece by piece, until, of course, they reached Berlin in May of 1945, when the Germans finally surrendered and the war was over. They lived in DP camps for a few years until they finally made it to America. They lived in, in Brooklyn, New York, and um, where Soma was born two years later. His older sister, Faye, was born in Poland <coughs> in 1945. And they got married right away after liberation, like right away, a few months later. And uh, they lived, they managed. And um, that's their story, but now, we're going to jump in time, pretend we're in, like, I don't know, some kind of time machine. And we're going to go 75 years later, and it was through, here's Karen Kreiger, right, daughter-in-law, Kvesnish, just somebody who's very, wants to keep this story alive. And it was through some Polish, letters written in Polish, that were found in, in Sam was the second to die, Esther died first. And after he died, my sister-in-law found these letters in his condo. And thank God she saved them. She didn't know what they were, but she, she thought, I better not throw these away. Thank God. And through these letters, we were able, with the help of a woman who's here in Seattle, who's Polish, she helped me translate them. And through all this work that we did, we found the three surviving children of those two Stish families. They were still alive. Now, mind you, they had large families, but there were only three still alive. I'm going to introduce you to them. This is Jan, Janina, 90 years old in this picture, and this is Genik. Genik was the youngest of all the children. He was eight, nine years old during the war. When we met him in Poland, in 2016, I went with Shlomo and all of our children and our son-in-law, and we had the merit to meet these righteous people. And Genik was describing to us how they helped Sam and Esther in hiding. He described that when they were hiding out in the pit in the forest, it was his job, eight-year-old boy, to take them food. Why? Because when you were hiding during World War II as a Jew, you weren't just hiding from the Nazis. You were also hiding from your Polish neighbors. Because if a Polish neighbor wanted to, if they found a Jew, dead or alive, and they turned them into the Germans, they got a reward of a kilo of sugar. And a kilo of sugar during the war was very, uh, that was worth a lot of money. So you had to hide from your neighbors as well as from the Nazis. And mind you, remember, Treblinka is only 10 miles away. The Nazis are driving by this forest. We walk on the road that is right by this forest that goes on to Treblinka. So it was not, it wasn't, you were really, they were, they were really hiding. But he, because he was the youngest, would take a pail, and they had food in the pail, and he would go out into the forest and pretend that he was playing in the forest. He would just sort of drop the pail somewhere near the, near the pit, and he'd go on and play. And if there were other people in the forest, they wouldn't, think anything of it. And then at, after dark, they would come out of the, uh, come up from the pit and get the food and, and have something to eat. They were hungry all the time, even though the stitches did help them with food, they were hungry all the time. Food was a constant, constant, constant problem. But as we sat with them for hours, we sat in their little, in their little living room in this tiny, tiny town called Stary Lipki in Poland. And they're telling us story after story. We're asking question after question. What an opportunity for us. And they say, well, when we're done talking, we'll go and we'll, we'll, we'll show you the pit that your parents lived in, they say to Shlomo. And, and we're like, right, we're like, what? You're, did you say that again? Yeah, well, don't you want to see the, the pit? And we're like, the pit is still there. And they're, they're like, yeah, the pit's still there. Do you want us to, to show it to you? And we're like, yeah. So we had no idea that we were going to see the actual pit that they lived in. And we did see the barn as well. The barn, it was um, in exactly the same spot. The Germans burned down the buildings on their way out when they, when they were retreating. But the, the, we saw the barn that, that was in the same 
the same space, the same type of barn where they where they hid and where that fake haystack was built. They showed us that. But then Gennett, this gentleman, walks us through the forest. And it was as if we were we were following a nine-year-old boy. He he knew exactly the way. He just marched right through the forest. And we walked in in anticipation of something that we were about to see that we couldn't have dreamed of ever having this happen to us. And we walked quietly in silence, all of us. And we could hear, you can see on the, on the forest floor, there are leaves here. And the trees are tall and skinny like that. And you could, I could hear those leaves crunching under my feet. And I could hear the wind in those trees. And then, he gets there and he says, here's the pit. And he points, you can see, mind you, it's 75 years later, but you can see the indentation of the pit. And Shlomo steps right into the pit. Didn't hesitate for a moment. You can see, imagine it was 75 years later and the erosion and the leaves and the dirt that have accumulated but that was the pit that they lived in. And just to introduce you to who was here with us, this is our daughter, Elisheva, our oldest daughter. This is Maria. Maria is Genyek's daughter. This is Shoshana, who's our daughter, who's married to this gentleman over here, Micha HaKohen. Uh, this is Esther, our youngest daughter, who's named for her grandmother, Esther. And this is our son, Jack. This is our translator, he was a terrific translator that helped us, and this was our videographer. We hired a videographer for the day. And um, it was a moment that happened to our family that changed us all, that changed every single person around standing there that day. And when I looked into that pit, I don't know, I had a jumble, a jumble of thoughts, but, but later, when I could sort my thoughts out just even a little bit, all I could think about was, when I get into bed tonight, I want to appreciate that I'm getting into a bed and that I'm not climbing down into a pit with dirt and bugs and lice and I'm, who knows what else is in that pit. Don't even want to think about it. But it's dark. There's no light. There's no refrigerator. There's, no, there's nothing in a pit. It's a pit in the forest. And I wanted to try my best to no longer take my bed for granted take my refrigerator full of food for granted, take my life for granted. And one of the things that I hope that people who read the books walk away with is an appreciation <laughs> for the goodness in our own lives and, and the fact that we are alive, but in our life, the blessings, the many blessings that we have to not take them for granted. We sat in the small living room with, of Genyek and, and Alicia Stitch for, like I said, a long time. We had many tears, and we laughed a lot. This is Shoshana and Maria. But then Shlomo rose to speak, and he's chuckling, because, like, this is the way that I describe it. How do you say thank you to people when you're preparing out for a trip? How do you think about, what are you gonna bring to people who, who saved your parents, in hiding, who, who helped them. Without them, they would not have survived. That, I think, is clear. So we have a box of chocolate, a picture, what are you gonna bring, right? So Shlomo has this great idea, and he's like, I am going to compose music. I'm going to compose music to a piece, a capital of Tehillim, to a chapter of Tehillim. And the first verse of the, that he took out of the chapter of Tehillim, it, it, if you got him chakras in the morning, it's the, it's the paragraph right before Baruch Sha'amar. It's in, it, that's the piece of Tehillim. And the, the, the words that, were, that, that he uses in the song are this. And the first verse is on Sam's grave, where he's buried in Israel. And it's Hashem Ha'alita Mishol Nashi Kitani Miyor Dibor. You, Lord, brought me up from hell, gave me life from the depths of the pit. A very appropriate passive verse for his grave. But then it goes on. Zamru la Hashem chasidav, behodu lezecher kacho, 
It's sing to the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. He read Abi Apo, Chaim Birzono, Ba'erev Yolim Bechi, Bela Bokerina. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I'm going to play a song that we sang together. Um, Shlomo got up and spoke very beautifully to, to, to the Stish family, thanking them for what they did to save his family and explaining how he wrote this song. And one of the key pieces of the song that he felt so strongly about was that it has this word, that it has this word, Zaru Hashem Chasidav, Chasidav, righteous ones. And of course, people, in non-Jews in World War II who helped save Jews, we call them the righteous ones. And so we thought of this, um, we thought of this as, a, as a way to thank them. choices that are big, bigger, and we sometimes don't know what the ramifications of those choices are until years later, well, maybe minutes later, but sometimes years later, when we showed the Stish family members a picture of the whole Goldberg family, and I'm just actually going to just scoot here, the whole Goldberg family that came from, from the help that they gave to these two individuals in this terrible, dark time of the world, especially in Poland. It was really a beautiful moment, and it was a choice that their parents made, and that they made, in fact. All the children were involved in, in helping, and it was a beautiful thing. There's another piece that's really important, that, that, if you, that, that, that steps way back from the whole story, which is, I just decided that I was going to tell this family story. 
And I think I succeeded. I mean, I, I published a book, so I succeeded in telling this family story. But anyone can tell their family story. And in, when you do, you will find family members and you'll find out things about your family that you never knew. This gentleman here is named Edu Liss, and this is his daughter, Marta. This is myself and our daughter, Esther. This is a picture we took in 2017, and it was through, I, I wrote a blog, and it's out you know, in the world, if you have a blog, and so a, a, a priest from Poland found me and told me that there was a Goldberg relative from that small town, farming town of Badatella, that had survived the war. And this is him. He stayed in Poland. And he decided being a Jew wasn't the best idea. He was a six-year-old boy when the war started. And he hid by knocking on doors, hiding in their barns, working for different Polish peasants, and he survived. But he decided being Jewish wasn't the smartest idea, so he became a Catholic, and lived his life in Poland as a Catholic, married a woman, they had three children, and um, and then we found him through this priest, through like, through like this, we found him through a miracle. And when we visited him, we talked and talked and he was very uh, withdrawn. I think in general he's withdrawn, he's a very traumatized, his, his daughters have told us, very, very damaged, traumatized person. But then he started opening up a little bit and he told us some of his memories of, of, of his early life in, in this small town. And then he took me and Esther and he grabbed us and he, and he, and he brought us close to him and he kissed us on our heads and he just looked us in the eye and he said, what took you so long? I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna close my presentation with a piece from the book that I, in which I tried my best to describe some of my conflicting, um, crazy, emotion, stormy emotions that I was experiencing after our first trip to Poland. The Poland trip was a roller coaster ride from the horror of Medanic to the joy of finding the Goldberg farm in Babatella, from the darkness of Treblinka to the goodness of the Stish family from the disgust of Auschwitz-Birkenau to the promise of Poles reconnecting with their Judaism. The entire time, Sam and Esther hovered, whispering in my ear that they knew the truth, that humans have the capacity for the greatest evil, to torture and kill, to shoot people into a pit, to gas them to death, to burn their bodies and extract the gold from their teeth. To hunt them down in the forest for a kilo of sugar. But there was another truth that they also knew. That humans have the highest capacity for kindness. To give a fellow prisoner a kilo of sugar. To hide and feed people as they are being hunted like animals. To cook food in a wash pot at Treblinka and bring it to the dying in the hospital, to stand up for someone else, even in a death camp, to save others when it puts your own children in danger. I opened up to holding these contradictory thoughts in my mind at the same time and living with the tension that it creates. Before this trip, I knew that I would discover new facts and meet new people. But what I didn't know was that I would reach the dark matter of the human soul. I now accept that humans are at once both evil and good. My work on Sam and Esther's story and my visit to Poland taught me that I can choose which side of my nature to express. This is my new reality. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very, very much. Very great. Thank you for a beautiful uh, presentation. How about that? The book is available, I guess, for purchase. Yes, for purchase. I'm happy to sign and, it. I'm happy to sign it. And um, you can have questions now. That before I'm giving the floor for questions, just two announcements. The ladies, tomorrow, 7.30, there's a special 
Rosh Chodesh Klav by Mr. Farkash Rauman. And don't forget, two and a half weeks from Wednesday night, Purim. Right here, same place, same time. But now, please have your questions and answers, and then uh, I will be happy to give you. How much is the book being sold for? Uh, it's sixteen fifty. Sixteen fifty. It's fifteen dollars plus tax, so it turns out to be sixteen fifty. Yeah. It's also available on uh, on a Kindle version, and also there's a really terrific Audible version, like an audio. Ver if you like audio books, you can get it as an audio book. Um, the woman who narrates it is a terrific. I, she's an actor who lives in New York. She did a great job, and the song is in the book. It's really cool. If you like the song and you want to listen to it again, it's on my website. If you go to my website, KarenTriger.com, um, and you kind of just scroll down the home page, you'll find the song, and you can you can listen to it as many times as you want. So I'm happy to answer questions um, that you might have, or we can just engender a discussion about other people's stories or people that you know that also survived the war. <coughs> No? Oh, I, I, um, the, the idea to write a book, I think yeah, so many people have that idea, <laughs> but to actually do it, how, how do you go from just an idea to actually doing it? Um, well, it was a, it was an act of love, and I started, so, um, Sam, Sam in his lifetime, um, left us with two full interviews of, about them, about his, his experiences, one that Shlomo videoed and one that the Shoah Foundation did. And his mom left one, one interview that she did. So I started with the interviews and I just reread them many times and tried to understand more about them and there were some contradictions in trying to put the puzzle together a little bit. But then what I really wanted to do was bring their story into the context of the larger war. So then, and, and the Holocaust in general. Um, Cause I wanted, I tried, I tried really hard in the book to be as factually accurate as I can. There's a lot of end notes. And um, I tried to cite every place that I say something that's a, a piece of factual information. So I, I went on, I felt like I, like I was like in a PhD program. I just started reading and studying and researching. And um, how did I do it physically? I just did it every day. And um, I exercised in the morning, and then I sat down and I worked. And then um, I would take breaks and stuff, but mostly I would um, spend half of my day writing. And so I took a course at the University of Washington. I'm a lawyer by training, and I thought that nobody is going to want to read a book that's going to be written by a lawyer because, you know, we write in a certain way, and it's just not a way that is exciting to read in a book. So I knew I had to kind of do something about that. So I took a course at the University of Washington and in the context of that, one of the speakers came and told me, I'm, okay, I'm 58 years old, like my kids know all about blogs and all this stuff and everything, but I did not. But I can learn, I'm a smart person. And this woman told us about this blog that she wrote in conjunction with a book she was writing. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Because I was learning all these different things about, like I knew about the Holocaust, but I didn't know in this way. I took a deep dive into the, what really, what really happened and how it happened and all this. And I wanted to, I thought I could make a blog and I could share with people who might want to read it, um, stories about Sam and Esther, but also things that I was learning in the thing. So I would spend, it was fun for me to practice writing and learn. So I'd spend part of my day research and part of my day writing. And so it broke up the different parts of the day. But um, <clears throat> it was very early on that I knew I was gonna have to go to Poland and I told Shlomo, I said, you know, I'm going to have to go to Poland. His parents, his mom especially, told him, don't ever go back to Poland. Don't for dark. Don't go back to dark Poland. And um, I said, I know if you, if you decide you can't go with me, I understand. And ultimately, he decided to go. That's right. He asked the Shiloh of our rabbi, and the rabbi said, yes, you could go, it's okay. He didn't make any vows to your parents, they just told him that, so it's okay. Anyway, so right away I started also having, sort of trying to figure out, what am I gonna do? Like the way that I found the Stish families was because I just wanted, I thought, I knew about this, we knew about Helena, we knew about her from the, from the interviews, we didn't know about the whole family helping, but we knew about Helena. 
And I thought, I just gotta find where Helena lived. I just, you know, I figured who knows who lives there now, right? But I just kind of want to stand there and take a picture. You know, it's really what I wanted to do. And then um, I called my sister-in-law, Faye. She's the oldest. She was born in Poland. She should know where these places are, right? I figured, you know, she was a child. It was a joke. And so I called her. I said, Faye, do you have, and she, but she had taken a trip to Poland. I said, do you have any idea where Helena lived? And she said, I'd like to go and find the place. She said, I have no idea. I have no idea. I said, do you have any guesses of how I might go about it? She said, no, no idea at all. Sorry, I can't help you. I said, okay, well, I wasn't, I was determined that I was going to find another way. But she said, well, you know, though, I do have this stack of letters that I found in my father's apartment after he died. I have no idea what they are because they're in Polish, but I saved them. Do you want me to send them to you? Yes, please. Yes, send them to me. I was so excited because in the meantime, I had met this woman in Seattle who speaks Polish, who is connected with the Seattle Holocaust Center. And we had been already quickly becoming friends. And so I showed her the letters and she translated them all for me. And not only did she translate them all for me, they, and of course, of course, the letters are from the Stish family. Sam and Esther corresponded with them all those years. We only had one side of the correspondence, but we had it. And so one night, in the middle of the night, this woman, Joanna, who was helping me translate them, just kept thinking she couldn't sleep. She was like thinking about this all the time. And she got up in the middle of the night, started Googling some of the names of the, of the authors of the letters. She found a relative of one of the one of the women who wrote most of the letter, a lot of the letters, and it was through that man that we were able to to then meet the whole family. And um, so, part of the fun of it was writing the blog. Part of the fun of it was putting the puzzles together. And um, I'll give you an example of something that a puzzle that I put together that I only can only hope and pray that like that Esther didn't realize this in her lifetime because it's too terrible to think about. When she left, for, when their family left for Bialystok, that member I showed you that, Blue Arrow or whatever like that. So she went first with her father, her brothers went first to Bialystok, and then she and her father went and they crossed that yellow line, that border, the Germans were in control of that border. But they were letting Jews pass, they wanted Jews to get them out of there. So they passed that through that border. She got through, mind you, she's 19 year, year old woman, right? And her father is however old. And, um, they grabbed her father, but he wore a kapata and he, had pay it. he was a, he had a Jewish looking man, let's just say. And they, they grabbed him, the Nazis grabbed him and said, Yid, you're gonna work for us today. And they made him build railroad tracks. And Esther waited for him, it was Arab Shabbos, she was frantic, and, but, and he ended up making it to the little town right near there. But all day he had to work on these railroad tracks. And the place where they crossed the border the name of that town is called Malkinia. Now, that won't mean anything to you, but it means a lot to me. Because Malkinia is the train station right before the Treblinka train station. And what that means is that the Germans were building their... This is 1939. Remember, there's no final solution. There's no Treblinka. Treblinka is 19... You know, two, two, three years later is when Treblinka is doing its thing. But the Germans are creating their infrastructure. And they're forcing these Jews trying to cross the border to help them build these railroad tracks. So Shlomo Zaman, the Malamed of Stuchik, helped to build the railroad tracks that two years later brought the Jews to Treblinka. And when I realized that one day, when I was doing, putting these this pieces of this puzzle together, trying to figure out where everything was and how everything got put together, I, I almost couldn't breathe that day. Like I was like, whoa. When I realized that, I just, I couldn't work the rest of the day. I just like started walking around the house like a zombie. I mean, these are things that I, I hope, again, I hope Esther didn't realize it in her life. I don't know, she never talked about it. I just hope she did it, because that's too tragic to, to think that, that, that that's what happened. But that is what happened. So in the course of my research, I was like putting puzzles together. So even though it's a, it's a terrible piece of news, Yet, for me, it was like being able to tell the story in this way where I'm putting pieces of the puzzle together in a way that tells a bigger picture is very, is, is, um, that's part of why the book is called My Soul is Filled with Joy. Because throughout the course of it, I, what my soul was filled with joy, even though I was dealing with a tragic subject. But this, this, this title 
the, these words themselves didn't come out of my mouth first. They first came out of the mouth of, let's see, I know the light's on, but we could look here. This gentleman here, his name is Zhigorj Meloshevsky, and he is the grandson of one of the two Stish families. And he was one of the first people that we connected with when we were finding these people in Poland. And um, for an hour, we spent on the phone, obviously I had a translator, this friend, Joanna, and we talked and talked, and his parents died when he was young, like 20 years old, and he was a self-made man in Poland, and he knew, he knew something that his grandparents helped him choose during the war, he didn't know the story. So I started to fill him in on what I know about what happened. And I'm telling him, and he's asking questions. For an hour, we're talking and talking. On, I was on an iPhone, like on an iPhone. It's crazy. And so at the end, he, and he's a very religious Catholic man. He had a big cross on his neck. He was a very, very religious man. And he looked into that iPhone and he said, my heart is full and my soul is filled with joy. And my my friend translator translated that for me, and I was like, oh, I'm like, I didn't know that would be the title of the book, but I'm like, that's so beautiful. So I'm like writing it down. And then later it came to me that, that was that was the right title. That was the right, that was the right. Because not only did that come from him, that's how I felt. That is really how I felt in writing the book and being able to bring this story to the world. And um, Sam and Esther's story is not gonna die with them. It's not, because it's it's in a book. And in my opinion, it's got to be a movie. It just has to be a movie. We'll see. Stay tuned. We'll see what we can do about that. Anyways, yes? Um, can you notice I got the chance? The <laughs> yes. So the first thing that I did when we got back from our trip in 2016, when we met them and all that stuff that happened, I spent two solid, I'm a lawyer, and I knew that the way to do this is to build a case. You have to have testimony from the children. And so I wrote a long, really like a, a declaration. I know all about writing declarations. We are a long declaration for Shlomo to sign that had all kinds of facts. I put together the video from the day. I put together the letters, put together a whole packet. And I had our daughter, Shoshana, who's um, married to Micha. They live in Israel. And I had her take it with her by hand to Yad Vashem. And she, and, 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 um, after the first person. Yeah, we have, the first person. yes, we have their videos. We've got the whole thing. I put the whole thing together. And um, in the end, I, I was happy and very unhappy because Yad Vashem decided there were two families, the Helena family and the Vatislava family. It was the women. Let's just put that out there. It was the women who were the main forces behind this saving of the helping, helping Sam and Esther. The dads were, were, were scared. I don't blame them. They were scared. They went along with it. They helped build the haystack and all that, but it was the women. And um, only Helena's family got the recognition. And yeah, that's not got a slot family. And they, I asked why, and they said, they said, listen, our criteria are very strict. And um, in the interviews that you sent us of your in-laws, of Sam and Esther, they really only mentioned Helena. It is true in their, I mean, the family members knew, Faye told me there was another family, like, like it wasn't like their parents never talked about it. So it's really true. And I asked my cousin and he knew, like, it's really true. They weren't like lying or anything. But in their interviews, they only mentioned Helena. She was clearly the main, the main person, and so they only gave it to them. But I take comfort. So you get it? The gentleman who I showed you who was that nine-year-old boy, his family's the one that didn't get it. And so when I went back to visit again in 2017, I, the, the decision had just come out, and I had to sit with them. They were angry. They were upset. And I had to explain to them you know, how upset I was, too, and what what happened, and that there's, it was sad. I and mean, then Shlomo went back for this, there was a ceremony in Warsaw where it was bestowed on them. They, were, they did like four families at once, and um, Shlomo went to Warsaw and he spoke at the, at the ceremony. So um, it was a very meaningful ceremony and a very meaningful thing. And I take, I take great pride in that, you know, throughout the next, you know, however many, forever, if you were to look up in the Yad Vashem web website of like who are the righteous among the nations, their name, their family name is there. So that's what happened. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all. I'm happy to.
sign books, sell books. Happy to do it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.